Bill Black, thank you for giving me some of your time. Uh, I wanted to ask you about modern monetary theory. Ah. I don't know much about it, if I'm completely honest. I expect it's quite a complex theory. So if you could just tell me a little bit about it, perhaps try and put it in a nutshell for me. Sure. Uh, and uh, my colleagues who specialize in this area mm. are among the folks uh, best known in the world. So I'll try to do them mm -hmm. uh, justice. Um, so modern monetary theory, uh, as they would say, uh, is in large part a description as opposed to a theory. In other words, this is how the monetary system actually operates. Mm. And so there's a historical component to it, to looking back and seeing how did people actually introduce money, for example, in Africa. And the way they uh, often introduced money, the European colonialists, is to impose a tax. Mm. And the tax was only payable in you know, the foreign currency, which otherwise the native peoples of Africa had no interest in this <laughs> currency at all. But once you created the taxation system and said it could only be paid, uh, say, uh, in the British pound, then people had to work very hard uh, because of the coercive nature of the state, you know, mm -hmm. the colonial regime, uh, to be able to earn those pounds and pay the Brits uh, and such. So there's that historical component that uh, actually reverses a lot of what economists tend to say is the way money uh, was created, mm -hmm. which turns out not to be historically true if you look to non-economists when they do the history of, of money uh, and such. So there's that aspect. The second uh, aspect is to realize that money matters. And it may seem strange, uh, given the importance of money, but macroeconomics for decades has pretty much ignored the existence of money mm -hmm. and not looked at what it really does or how it's created or, or such. So modern monetary theory explicitly talks about money, mm -hmm. says it is important, and says this is how uh, it's created. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, the modern part, uh, it looks at the difference. It's, the modern part is, by the way, sort of an inside joke. <laughs> they don't much like this title, modern monetary mm -hmm. theory, but it's stuck, so they use it. Um, but the mon modern part, as I said, is sort of an inside joke but because you're talking about something that's existed for centuries. Mm. Uh, it's not like it was just created uh, and such. But it certainly now exemplifies modern life, um, modern fiat currency. So a fiat currency is one that is not backed by something like a precious metal, like mm. gold standard uh, and such are now the norm as opposed to uh, unusual. But fiat currencies have existed for uh, centuries. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if you go to one aspect of the modern monetary theory is a critique of the gold standard and silver standards mm -hmm. and other such uh, things. Uh, and they don't tend to work very well. Uh, they'll work for a time uh, and then they'll produce really severe depressions. Yeah. And when we had the gold standard, while the U.S. existed, uh, we were thrown into about seven uh, Great Depressions. Since we went off the gold standard, we haven't had a Great Depression, although the current crisis, the Great Recession, shows you can still have some really bad stuff uh, happen under a fiat currency. But at least you don't get throwing the world, in, in, you know, uh, and fairly commonly uh, into really severe depressions that hurt everybody. They also looked historically as to what nations did when they got into trouble on a gold standard. So let's say you were at war and you couldn't bring in enough gold. Would you just surrender to the other nation? I mean, that'd be nuts, right? Um, and indeed, it's something you should always ask whenever somebody says, you know, we've run out of money. You can't run out of money if it's your own money, if it's your sovereign currency uh, and such. And, you know, the, the Brits have said this recently, that, you know, the head of the government, we're running out of money. And so do this hypothetical. What if uh, some nation, just call it Germany, uh, were to invade uh, England tomorrow? Would England say, I'm sorry, we can't defend ourselves? Uh, we've run out of money. Um, of course not. Right? So uh, when wars hit really severe crises, nations tended to drop out 
of the gold standard because it would be a suicide pact mm -hmm. uh, at that point and such. So the gold standard um, provided, in some sense, discipline. That's what uh, its proponents say. It was harder to have a really severe inflation, but it wasn't impossible to have massive bubbles, and there were yeah. massive bubbles under the gold standard as well. So um, what modern monetary theory says, in significant part in terms of policy these days, is you've got rules and practices that were required under a gold standard that make no sense under a fiat currency, so you've got to figure out how different a fiat currency is, and modern monetary theory looks at how it's different, looks again in a descriptive sense, how does it actually work, and then the policy implications, all of that. So among those uh, descriptions and policy implications that are, uh, how does money actually get created in a modern system? And it gets created by uh, keystrokes on a computer. Now, people don't like to hear that, but that's an actual operational truth. And at the operational level, that's one of the reasons why uh, modern monetary theory has a lot of support among the financial community. Because they go, yeah, that's how it actually happens. All this other stuff is uh, a fiction about uh, how it uh, happens. So, for example, there's no re need, if you have a sovereign currency, to actually issue debt. You can issue the currency mm -hmm. directly. Um, the currency is a debt relationship, right? The government is uh, a promising to pay. That's the uh, full faith and credit uh, stand behind uh, the currency. But you don't have to do these IOUs uh, in the sense. And so one of the questions is, um, do we need to balance the budget? Should, is balancing the budget a good thing? Um, and if you ask the usual person in the street, quite understandably, they'll say, well, of, of course it is. In fact, it's a moral imperative. In fact, if we don't, it's bad for our children and our grandchildren. We're creating a burden of debt or some other variant in the United States say that we've mortgaged our future to the Chinese and they're going to control us uh, completely because of the debt. Um, but in fact, a government is that has its own sovereign currency uh, is an issuer of a currency, not a user of the currency. And so it is nothing like a household. And it, the government also is nothing like a household in terms of the fundamental impact it has on economics. So let's give examples in, a, in the current uh, period. If you and I, as our household, we get into trouble, you know, we have too much debt and such, we cut back and, you know, don't go out to eat, uh, don't go to those movies and such, we save in the midst of a great recession because we have too much credit card debt, say, uh, and such. Perfectly rational strategy for us. And each individual action of us doesn't affect other people very much. Mm. The government, if it cuts back on the spending and such, it affects however big the nation is and often affects beyond the nation if you're uh, a big nation uh, economically like the United States. If the United States goes into austerity, uh, then we produce, in the midst of a great recession, then we push potentially the nation into a great depression. And so you've seen in Europe this fundamental a lack of understanding of the necessity to have, a, or at least the highly desirable nature of a sovereign currency. So much of Europe gave up a sovereign currency by adopting a euro. And then uh, not understanding that that's going to mean that at the worst possible time, when private sector demand is already inadequate because of a great recession, people losing their jobs, um, so then you get the paradox of thrift. You, I, a whole bunch of other folks start cutting back, perfectly rational, but that means private sector demand, which was already inadequate to actually employ everyone, right? If there are not enough people buying the cars, buying the refrigerators and such, businesses 
say, well, we can't sell it, so why make it? So they'll hire fewer people, and indeed they'll lay off, and more businesses will fail, and all of that will produce unemployment. And as people get worried about unemployment and their debt overhang, they tend to cut back their expenditures more. And that's why a recession can persist or even slip into a Great Depression, which is what you don't want to do, right? That's just massive waste to have people who want to work, who are able to work, that you can sign to doing nothing. And in fact, you can sign to doing nothing plus they get benefits uh, and such. And it's not good for people mm. to be unemployed, mm. right? And they react badly, and especially men react badly to being unemployed. They tend to drink more, they tend to be more abusive. Those are statistical mm. statements, not everybody, of course, but that's what uh, tends to happen. So you want to avoid that situation. Mm. You want the government to step in and to increase public sector demand if private sector demand has fallen and is inadequate to employ people. And that's what are called automatic stabilizers, or in jargon, a counter-cyclical policy. Okay. Counter means you want to fight against wherever you're moving, the economy is moving you into a deeper and deeper depression. Well, you want to fight that. You want to have a counter that business cycle. Or if you're moving into severe inflation, you want to counter that as mm -hmm. well. And things like the income tax, when they're progressive rates, in other words, higher marginal tax rates for richer people, well, they work automatically to stabilize the system because in inflationary times, they bring in a lot more income, which tends to dampen private sector demand. And in recessionary times, they bring in a lot less income. You run a deficit and that helps the uh, people recover. Modern monetary theorists often, therefore, and certainly my uh, colleagues at University of Missouri, Kansas City, um, like uh, Randy Ray and Stephanie Kelton have written about this a great deal, that it makes sense, therefore, to have a jobs program. Mm -hmm. The federal government should offer, shouldn't do it entirely through government, in fact, maybe not even primarily through government, as opposed to uh, non-governmental organizations, other charities and such, get people doing useful things. Mm -hmm. We have a desperate need for all of those. It's a win-win-win uh, situation, right? It's a win for the people who were unemployed. Yeah. Uh, it's a win for the people they provide services to and build, help build roads and all those other good types of things. And it's a win to the economy. It helps the economy recover more strongly. And so if you're worried about deficits, then what you definitely don't want to do is to create a gratuitous second recession which is what austerity insisted on by Berlin has done. Uh, that would be nuts, and that's kind of nuts is the <laughs> policy that we have uh, right now. Um, modern monetary theory also looks at, well, if the government runs a deficit, will we be hurting the kids and the grandkids? Well, what hurts kids and grandkids? is throwing their parents into unemployment utterly gratuitously, mm -hmm. right? And often increasing the deficit by doing that. So if you're worried about deficits, you should be a really strong fan of modern monetary theory. Now let me uh, explain, I've mentioned several times sovereign currency. Mm -hmm. What does this mean? Um, if you have your own currency, right, so the United States concept, context the dollar, or the Brits have the pound mm -hmm. uh, and such. And if you let that currency freely float, that means you don't try to fix its exchange rate, and say it's always worth two pounds or you know a half a pound type of thing. And then if you borrow in your own currency, right? So when I borrow internationally, I borrow in dollars as opposed to another currency then you are not subject to the bond vigilantes mm. that are whipsawing Europe. So look at the deadly cycle you get into in Europe. Say mm. you're Spain, and this is before the uh, European Central Bank, the ECB, intervenes and starts creating a quasi-sovereign mm. currency. But back when you had pure no ECB role and you had given up your currency, your Spain, 
and then you get into economic trouble. Not because you were running a deficit, Spain was running surpluses, but because you had this huge bubble and a great recession. And unemployment gets very large. And you respond because the Germans demand that you respond in this way, through austerity. That throws the country into Great Depression level unemployment. So Spain now has unemployment over 25% yeah. and youth unemployment of over 50% and unemployment in the poorer regions like Andalusia of uh, over 30%, just catastrophic mm -hmm. levels. Well, what does that do? Uh, that means that they're going to have a massive governmental deficit because tax revenue is going to fall as people are unemployed and expenditures for uh, unemployment and for poverty uh, are going to increase. So the deficit has to increase very substantially. <clears throat> and here you go. One of the key things modern monetary theory says is you can't simply use a dial and set your deficit. So for example, hey, maybe I could reduce my deficit by raising taxes. That seems to make sense. That brings in revenue. And maybe I could reduce my deficit if I'm Spain by reducing expenditures. That seems to make sense. For a household, that would work automatically. Not for a nation. In a great recession, if I increase my taxes and I'm Spain, net then I can substantially reduce private sector demand, which by definition in a great recession is already deeply inadequate. So I make it the recession worse. Mm -hmm. And if I cut government spending, then I simultaneously reduce public sector demand, which was already inadequate. And so by definition, I make the recession worse. When I make the recession worse, my tax revenues fall, <coughs> my expenditures uh, tend to go up instead of down, and you can see that Spain doesn't get out of its deficit yeah. through this strategy. It, it starts gets, to seem like there's no way out. It gets thrown into a Great Depression, and that's only the first stage. Yeah. And the second stage is the bond vigilantes. Now, Spain can't borrow. It doesn't have a sovereign currency. A sovereign currency, I can always pay my debts. Mm -hmm as long as they're in my own currency, because I make my currency. But Spain doesn't have that. So Spain's only way to borrow, to finance that deficit, is to borrow in the international markets, or at least it's the primary way. And the bond vigilantes will say, oh, you're very risky, and so we'll charge you more. Well, what happens to your expenses if you're Spain if your borrowing costs go up substantially, they have to go up, and this, all of their factors being held constant, tends to increase your deficit. So what do the credit rating agencies do? They downgrade your credit rating. And what do the uh, bond folks do in response to that? They further increase your expenses, and it's a death spiral. Hmm. 